So we are here to discuss Leave in Neverland and Michael Jackson's legacy. It's my honor to welcome this amazing journalist, columnist, TV host, all the way from Los Angeles, John Ziegler. John, welcome to N1. Thanks so much for having me. John, first of all, just let's make one thing clear. You are not a fan of Michael Jackson or his music. Well, I, I don't dislike Michael Jackson's music. I, I am a child of the 1980s, so you had to at least be <laughs> exposed to Michael Jackson a little bit. But it's not like I'm anywhere near a fan. And in fact, as a former radio talk show host from here in Los Angeles during his 2005 trial, I presumed at the beginning of that trial that he was guilty of the charges against him because I'm a political conservative who pretty much believes everyone is guilty and believes that law enforcement and, mm -hmm. and the prosecution is usually right. I, so I have where, changed where my mind there rather smoke, dramatically there's about fire. It. Where there's smoke, there's fire. That was your opinion at the time. Correct. All right, so, but why such persistence today in proving uh, Dan Reed wrong? Well, because when I watched the film, I was rather horrified, first, by its abject unfairness. The first column I wrote about this was entitled, Michael Jackson could be guilty as hell, and leaving Neverland would still be very unfair. And that's where I started from. I started from the standpoint of, wait a minute, from basic journalistic and documentary filmmaking, and I'm a documentary filmmaker myself, ethics, this film was completely and totally one-sided and very extremely, dangerously unfair because it provided only one side of the story about a dead man. And I mean, first of all, just by virtue of the fact that Michael Jackson has now been dead for 10 years, it's obviously nearly impossible to defend yourself in a, in a situation that's basically one person's word against another person's word. That right off the bat should have given HBO uh, a reason to pause about whether or not they should go and provide four hours plus a special hosted by Oprah Winfrey, Oprah Winfrey to, to, yep. to, to, to validate just how awesome this story is. So I began from that premise, and as I began to further investigate the claims, they just don't, frankly, pass the laugh test, even though this is a very serious subject. They're absurd on their face, and there's nothing to corroborate them, and there's a mountain of evidence which contradicts what they're saying. So what, what do you think it was, it is a reason behind doing uh, Leaving Neverland now, 10 years into Michael Jackson's death? Why not before? Well, the, the two men at the center of this film, James Safechuck and Wade Robson, they didn't start to make their allegations against Michael Jackson until 2013, which was four years after his death. And, and that's what I would ask people to begin with right there. Right there, the allegations are inherently, at the very least, mm -hmm. suspect, if not absurd. These are two men in, uh, in their adulthood. These are not even young men. I mean, they're in their 30s at this point when they make the allegations who uh, have lived very interesting and involved lives, and uh, they're, they clearly know everything they're, they're, they need to know about sexuality. They're heterosexual men. Uh, they've been in a heterosexual relationships, some of them very prominently. And then all of a sudden, for the first time after praising Michael Jackson for many years, testifying on his behalf in the case of Wade Robson very dramatically in 2005, going to his funeral, having your entire family go to his funeral, writing a chapter in a book after his death about how he's the most amazing human being that, uh, that uh, life has ever seen. That's not even an exaggeration. It's almost a direct quote. All of a sudden, four years after Michael Jackson's death, you come forward with these allegations with no corroboration that don't make any sense. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, right there, you have to look at these allegations in a very suspect manner. Otherwise, you're creating a precedent that is unbelievably dangerous, not just for celebrities, but for everybody. If this is something that can be believed even after someone has been dead for quite a while, then what won't be believed? And and so, you know, the, the answer to your question about why leaving Neverland now, I think that this director, Dan Reed, has an agenda on this topic. I think he uh, saw two people who were desperate to get publicity for their lawsuit, which had gone nowhere, had been tossed mm -hmm. out of court, 
And I think that uh, he used them, they used him. And HBO may have some sort of a corporate agenda or maybe the tool of someone who has a corporate agenda. I think there's a lot going on behind the scenes here that has very little of anything to do with Michael Jackson and certainly nothing to do with whether or not Michael Jackson ever abused Wade Robson and James Safechuck, which I'm confident he did not. All right. All right, John. Let's talk facts because facts, they matter. Uh, that's the most important thing in this story. This is something that Dan Reed was not able to deliver eventually. Uh, so uh, there are absolute inconsistencies in the story of Wade Robson and James Jimmy Safechuck. First of all, media has dissected uh, the story, made it their own, tabloids did their job, and even the first month into airing, the media has uh, started using the word alleged abuse more often. How much, in your opinion, has this um, well, so-called documentary done damage to Michael Jackson's legacy? You know, that, that's an interesting question that's open for debate. Uh, I mean, there are ABC uh, here in America just did an article uh, yesterday that indicated that the damage has been quite limited. There have been other articles in Variety, for instance, that uh, indicated that there's been quite a bit of damage done to even Prince Forbes, Prime. even Forbes at the very beginning, if you remember, John, remember that article that Forbes did? I, I'm not sure if I remember specifically what you're talking about yet, but there's certainly been a lot of articles that have indicated, especially around the 10th anniversary of his passing, that there have been a lot of media outlets that have been frightened of the toxicity of doing anything that remotely celebrates Michael Jackson and his life and his legacy, and that those have been uh, scrapped. And uh, we're not going to see nearly the kind of fanfare you might expect uh, for the 10th anniversary of his death, which is, I believe, why why we're having this conversation today. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that there has been some damage. I don't think it has been as much as maybe HBO or Dan Reed had expected or hoped. I think from a factual standpoint, the film has been, in a rational world, discredited you know, on, on many uh, different levels. I mean, there are things that are said in the film that are just not accurate, that are impossible based upon the timeline. But I would, again, ask people to go and even think about just the, 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 the very big picture here. It is inherently absurd to think that these guys could, four years after Michael Jackson's death in a lawsuit, contradict everything that they had ever said, everything that they'd ever done, including under oath, uh, with no corroboration. That, that's absurd on its face, and that's what you're being asked to believe. And then that when you get into the details of the story, not only is there no corroboration, there's not even a remote hint of providing the other side. And so if you're really that sure of yourself, Dan Reed, then why did you need to be so one-sided? Why did you need four hours of drone shots and dramatic music without even mentioning, for instance, that Brandy Jackson, Michael Jackson's niece, dated your star, Wade Robson, during the time of the alleged allegations and for seven or eight years after that lost her virginity to him and was cheated on by him and is positive he's not telling the truth wow. why was she never mentioned wow wow well uh john you have invited dan reed uh on your podcast uh but he really n he never really responded uh why would he avoid answering the obvious questions well, Dan Reed has been challenged a couple of times in interviews not in America. Uh, in America, we, the, the, the limited number of interviews that he and Wade Robson and James Safechuck have done have been basically softballs by Oprah Winfrey and Oprah Winfrey's best friend, Gail King. But Piers Morgan uh, in Great Britain went after him a little bit, and he, and he crumbled pretty badly. The French went after Dan Reed a little harder, and he completely collapsed. So uh, I, I don't think Dan Reed would have much of a chance against me because I don't accept any of the premises that the rest of the media does, and especially here in America. In America, post Me Too, the American media is completely cowed and terrified of even remotely questioning an alleged victim of any sort of sexual abuse. They are presumed now to be telling the truth regardless how of how inconsistent, how absurd, how contradicted their story is. 
And that, to me, is very dangerous. And it's one of the reasons why I've taken on this story, partially because very few, if anybody else, will in America, mm -hmm. but also because mm -hmm. I think this is indicative of a much larger problem that I'm seeing constantly, especially in the post-Me Too era. All right. Now you had a chance to speak both to uh, Brandy Jackson, uh, Michael Jackson's niece, and Taj Jackson, Michael Jackson's nephew. Uh, what is the most remarkable thing uh, they told you? Well, and it's not just those two. I, I've met, talked to other members of the Jackson family. I've done the first extensive interview after leaving Neverland with Michael Jackson's criminal attorney, Tom Mazzaro. I've spoken to other people who have been uh, close to this case. I spoke to someone who worked uh, essentially for Wade Robson during the, the creation of this documentary, who had a conversation with Wade, who is positive Wade was not abused by Michael Jackson. But as far as the family is concerned, I think if, there's, if you take this in a very big picture way, the thing that hit me most remarkably about the family is how open they are about discussing all of this and how they're, they're not at all putting their head in the sand. They, they're open to talking about all of your concerns, all of your questions. They acknowledge that Michael Jackson was a unique individual, that he did things that were weird and that to the average person seem incomprehensible and that this is why people have presumed the worst, especially in evaluating these kinds of allegations. So I found them to be incredibly open, incredibly honest, not fearful at all, very secure in their positions, and also without an agenda. See, that's the other part of this mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. people need to understand. I think there's a presumption that the Jackson family, all of them are living off of Michael Jackson's estate or his legacy, and that's just not true. They're not involved with the estate. They're, they don't get any money from Michael Jackson's estate. Uh, obviously, his reputation matters to them, but I sensed, especially from Taj and from Brandy, his uh, nephew and niece, respectively, who spent an awful lot of time with Michael Jackson, mm -hmm. they're doing what they're doing and saying what they're saying out of love for him and for desire for the truth to win out, because they know what's being said is not true, especially Brandy Jackson, who knew Wade Robson as well as anybody possibly could have. And in fact, it should be pointed out, was set up with Wade Robson with... Uh, with Wade Robson by her her uncle, Michael Jackson, which completely contradicts a large part of what Wade Robson was saying in Leaving Neverland, which is that Michael Jackson told him that uh, not to trust girls and to stay away from girls. Well, it was Michael Jackson that set him up it's with his just, first it doesn't, it doesn't his own niece. Add up. It doesn't add up. Now, Jackson died at the age of 50 from an overdose of anesthetic propofol on June 25, 2009, exactly 10 years ago. Sexual abuse allegations in a 2005 child molestation trial ended with his acquittal. But yet we see media put him back on trial even in his death. Now, this is someone that is no longer here, as you said, to defend himself. Um, now, media in United States is still doing so, but European media has a quite uh, different stand and do not fall under the allegations that are not proven, looking for facts. Now, why is the media in the United States so different from media across the world? Uh, that's a great question. And uh, I wish I had a full answer, but here's the best I can come up with. Number one, the Me Too movement has had a much larger impact here in America. Everybody in the American media is terrified of losing their own jobs. So therefore, anything that has anything to do with a uh, sex abuse allegation, they immediately support it because that's where the safety is. You can only get fired from your job if you, if you confront uh, a Me Too allegation and turn out to be wrong. Or heck, you might even lose your job if you turn out to be right. Uh, but more specifically, I think this has much to do with Oprah Winfrey. I believe that if Oprah Winfrey had not blessed uh, or sanctified these two allegations by hosting an incredibly uh, softball interview with these two uh, uh, accusers and the director, Dan Reed, on HBO after part two aired on HBO, if Oprah Winfrey doesn't sanctify this film, I do think that there would have been elements of the news media that might have gone, hey, wait a minute. 
there's some problems here. But because Oprah has sanctified it and she is viewed as some sort of a saint by the vast majority of the news media and everyone's afraid of her, that stifled any real uh, contradictory sort of uh, coverage of this film. I know, and but I really John, doesn't it doesn't it struck you the, the the fact that she did it exactly in time when her friend Harvey Weinstein uh, was on trial? Uh, is that something that we should see as a connection to uh, after Neverland airing on own uh, network, uh, Oprah's network? You know, there are a lot of people who have made that connection, and I'm not saying that it's irrelevant. I'm an anti-conspiracy person. I don't believe in <laughs> large conspiracies. Um, I, so I don't really know for sure what the Harvey Weinstein situation is, partially because, you know, today Weinstein has no power at all. So I'm not sure why anyone would be doing Harvey Weinstein's bidding uh, I think that there could be other corporate influences behind the scenes that are impacting things more, far more dramatically. I, I, my gut tells me that the Harvey Weinstein timing is more coincidental. Yes, she was friends with Harvey Weinstein. And yes, uh, this story certainly has, has taken attention away from Harvey Weinstein. But I, I don't know for sure that that's uh, all part of, again, what I might refer to as a conspiracy. But there, there are a lot of corporate influences mm -hmm. going on behind the scenes in ways that I think would blow people's minds if they knew the full story. And whether or not we'll ever find that out or not, for sure, I don't know. I just received a tweet just during our conversation uh, that said uh, not doing an after Weinstein type of show with her buddy Harvey's uh, victims in the studio. I could go on and on and on. I'm sure you guys are going to have a great chat. Uh, Bobby wrote that. But the interest in this interview on Twitter is huge. Uh, we received a lot of questions, as you could have seen. So um, I suggest let's focus on some of these fan questions around the world, okay? Sure. All right. So we have a, a Twitter DP that said, please tell us why media is not speaking about the living abusers who were pointed out by so, so many people in Me Too. Why only Michael? Well, he has so many proofs of innocence, yet ignoring his proofs and only speaking about the lies of the of his abusers. Why is media doing this? Well, Michael Jackson is an incredibly easy and enticing target. Uh, first of all, he's one of the most famous people or was one of the most famous people in the world. At one time, probably was the most famous person in the world. So celebrity is everything. So there's inherent interest in his story. He was perceived as exceedingly weird for some pretty good reasons. And so therefore, allegations against him are much more easily believed than they would be against somebody else. I happen, you know, speaking of Weinstein, Weinstein is probably guilty as hell, but if Harvey Weinstein looked like George Clooney, no one would believe any of these allegations against him. It's mostly because he's ugly that it's very easily believed. Well, in, in a similar situation, it, Michael Jackson, it's easy to believe him as a pedophile because he acted in a very weird way, or at least what would be perceived as a weird way towards children. And then thirdly, I guess the, the, the easiest part of this for the media is he's dead. And because he's dead uh, here in the United States, mm -hmm. you cannot defame him. You can legally say anything you want about him. And he can't defend himself. So you have a very famous person who is perceived as weird and who's dead. That's a great target. And that's why the media uh, has embraced, along with the Oprah Winfrey angle, why they've embraced leaving Neverland to a large degree. So Annette was uh, t saying something about that. Uh, she said uh, the law needs to change in order to prevent this from ever happening again. It should not have happened to Michael Jackson. He had been uh, persecuted in life and death by the media. So as you said, the law in the United States does not protect the, the seas from defamation. Um, how would you comment on this? And this is a different situation all over the Europe. It's only in the United States that the law does not protect the deceased. Right. I, I, um, I can understand why people would want to see the law changed. I'm not sure that I would allow for defamation against a dead person. But I think that 
a dead person's estate should have more standing in going after people who have defamed them. Uh, that sounds like a small distinction, but I think legally it's important in a, in a way that Michael Jackson estate is trying to get around that in the way that they are suing HBO. But to me, if you say something that's false about a dead person that devalues their estate, there ought to be some means for rectifying that in, the, in a legal court. And currently, that's not really the case. So I can understand why people would like to see that changed. Mm -hmm. I, we have Violet uh, also tweeting at us. She said, assuming that Taj's documentary happens, uh, I imagine many journalists will ignore it out, out of embarrassment for being proven wrong. What tactics would you propose to demand coverage of the rebuttal? Should we ever hope for them to retract prior slanderous statements? Uh, you said you'll address this in your yesterday's podcast. Well, I applaud uh, Taj Jackson for, for doing his documentary. I think anything that puts out the truth is inherently of value. But having been through the wars on this topic before on other stories, I can assure you that the basis of the question is correct. And that is the media is never going to admit that they're wrong on something like this, especially the more chips they put on a particular side of a story, the less chance they're ever going to admit that they're wrong, uh, unless they're 100 percent forced to. And that means that there's only a couple of things that could ever possibly force a major change in this narrative. Number one, Oprah Winfrey decides to recant her support for the film. I think that's highly unlikely un, uh, because she doesn't want to admit that she was wrong. One of the accusers recants their stories. Uh, that's probably also unrealistic because they've got a lot of money at stake in this, and it would be awfully embarrassing for them. Uh, I think there, there's another possibility that um, I don't know what I'm, I necessarily want to talk about publicly very much, but there are ways to embarrass the filmmaker in a way that could discredit him uh, that I don't know whether or not uh, anyone is willing or able to do that. But um, but I, I know that I, if I anyone ever came to me, I would have some ideas on how to do that that I think would be probably Share pretty effective. Share one idea. <laughs> Share at least but, one idea. Well, I, I, let's just say Everybody want to know that. Everybody's waiting to hear that. Well, I, I think that I'm challenging you. <laughs> I, I think that Dan Reed is very vulnerable to being exposed as a fraud uh, under the right circumstances, and I don't think it would be very difficult. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> We've noticed a troll account that Dan Reed's uh, Dan Reed operated, um, and the fans had a chance to actually screenshot, do a screenshot of the troll account, and he was tweeting on behalf of uh, Leaving Neverland movie, and that was that was pretty funny to to. Uh, witness. We have another tweet. A skeptic tweeted us and he said, um, ask John about what he thinks about Oprah. And this is something that you just addressed. Oprah getting an early screening of the movie despite the family having to wait till it aired. Yeah, th this is a, a, one of the weirder parts of this whole story. So Oprah first saw the film along with her friend Gail King on David Geffen's boat on her birthday, which seems like a really weird day. Hey, let's, well, I doubt they watched all four hours, but uh, let's watch a, a movie about uh, child, a graphic, horrible, horrendous movie about child molestation on, my birthday. on, your, birth, <laughs> on, your, on your birthday while you're on a boat. Crazy. Um, you know, it, it, I, I, I think the most important take, the, the, the two takeaways I get from that are, is uh, well, there's a couple. Uh, number one, uh, obviously, this was part of an attempt to get uh, Oprah Winfrey's blessing, uh, and David Geffen, for some reason, uh, wanted that to happen and went to great lengths to make sure that that happened. Uh, and then he not only once you get uh, Oprah Winfrey's blessing and Gail King is there, uh, then you then you also get Gail King's blessing, and that's important because then you can have the the two accusers appear on her show, and it makes it seem like they're doing interviews when they're not really doing interviews. When you when your interviews are with Oprah Winfrey and Gail King, first of all, that's essentially the same person, and second of all, they're already invested in your side of the story, uh, especially since Oprah Winfrey is an, as an abuse victim herself. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think that rightfully a lot of people have looked at David Geffen's role in this. David Geffen has some skeletons in his own closet. 
Uh, David Geffen also might have some agendas within the music industry, maybe some uh, some retribution he's looking for or to punish people. I, I don't. This is speculation on my part, but the David Geffen element of this I think is interesting. And there's also some evidence that Oprah has been rewarded for her help in this in this matter with the project that projects that she's now involved with involving Apple and the royal mm -hmm. family of Great mm -hmm. Britain and uh, and the other elements of, of so this is really I think the way I look at so it is, is this all like business John thing. is this then all business I think a lot of this is business. Um, but to I had do a that to somebody uh, that has been such a great uh, humanitarian, uh, to do something like this just because of the business sake, I mean, what, what are we doing? What are we looking at here? Well, you clearly look at the world differently than a lot of these people do. Uh, these these uh, corporate giants have a lot on the line, they have a lot to gain, a lot to lose, and to them, Michael Jackson has been dead for 10 years. He can't do anything for them anymore. He can't give Oprah Winfrey an interview anymore. Uh, you know, there's very little, if anything, that the Jackson estate can do for them. And, you know, I, I look at this as almost a, a Game of Thrones uh, situation behind the scenes. Uh, Michael Jackson appears to me to be a chess piece in a, in a much larger game. Again, I'm not alleging some sort of conspiracy. I, I think that we have a situation where people are pursuing what they perceive to be in their self-interest, and that Michael Jackson's legacy has largely become a game. And that's mm -hmm. not right. That's wrong for anybody, regardless of what you think about Michael Jackson and, and who he was as a person, whether or not he was guilty of these mm -hmm. allegations or not. That's not the way that these things ought to be decided. But that's the that's the modern media world in which we now live, especially here in the United States. All right. Shani 101 said on his Twitter profile, I'd like to know Dan Reed's real motive here. He has just been so unprofessional with this BS, always trying to uh, rectify the massive credibility issues, uh, trolling fans, and first claiming he did three weeks of research, then claiming he researched for 18 months. Credibility well, issues. I have never seen it. Again, I'm a documentary filmmaker myself. I've made three pretty major uh, documentary films on very different subjects. And I have never seen a documentary filmmaker as invested in uh, his stars as this one. I mean, just by virtue of the fact that they they do promotional photographs together and they do their interviews together, uh, he is essentially their spokespeople. He's the one who's been explaining James Savechuk's false story uh, about the train station uh, and, and the fact that the train station didn't exist when he said he was abused on the second floor of the train station. This I've never heard of this before. This is not the role of a documentary filmmaker. This is a, a, a essentially he's playing the role of the, their PR person, uh, which is completely wrong and inappropriate. Now, what is motivating him? I think one, he's far more well known today, and 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 dealing with a lot of very high powerful people, high powered people that he's never dealt with before. All of this, so he probably believes that he has benefited. His profile has certainly been raised. But you know, I, I think there's something about this subject matter. And one of the things about the film that I have tried to, our, to uh, educate people about, and, and some others have as well, that the media has completely ignored, is that at the basis of this movie, the foundation mm -hmm. of the, these claims, is really uh, a, an argument, as bizarre as it sounds, that man-child, man-on-boy sex is not only not bad, that it's actually pleasurable, enjoyable, and a romantic endeavor. I mean, that is at the heart of this whole film, yeah. which most people, I think, would look at and go, what? What, what are you doing? That, was, that was pretty much reaction. A film. That was pretty much the reaction that most people had. That, that was my reaction as well. Well, it, so that begs the question, what is Dan Reed doing here? What is his agenda? I mean, he has made statements in the media that support the, the uh, allegation I just made that the media basically just ignored because they fell in love with the narrative. They, they don't want to do anything to, to criticize the director of the film. But you cannot separate 
You cannot separate the allegations in this film and the theory behind them, which is that these guys didn't know they were abused until their 30s, well after Michael Jackson was dead, because it was such a pleasurable, wonderful, enjoyable, romantic experience. That's absurd. What does this tell age. us? What does this tell us about um, real victims of child abuse out there? Um, what does this tell us? Well, I look at a, a lot of this as kind of a pendulum. And unfortunately, we live in a world, especially here in the United States, where when the pendulum goes too far in one direction, we tend to go way too far in the other direction to correct. And clearly there was a time period, whether it was the 60s, 70s, maybe even to the, into the 80s, when child sex uh, vic abuse victims were not believed, they were too afraid to come forward. Uh, and a lot of this stuff uh, was allowed to happen behind closed doors, and that was wrong. I think we're now living in a world where uh, we are far too willing to believe any sort of allegation, and that hurts real uh, victims of child mm -hmm. sex abuse because, you know, and, and frankly, if, if, if I had been a, a, a victim of child sex abuse, I would be incensed at James Safechuck and Wade Robson. By the way, one of the parts of this film uh, that's missing that to me was a red flag right off the bat is if these guys are telling the truth. Every victim of child sex abuse, including the victim, alleged victim that went, uh, that caused Michael Jackson to go on trial in 2005, where he was acquitted of all the charges, should be furious at them because it was Wade Robson's false testimony that harmed his ability to get a fair trial mm -hmm. against Michael mm -hmm. Jackson. And it was James Safechuck, allegedly, this is false, but his story is him being unwilling to come forward and tell his story at trial in 2005. Yeah, Where's that's a great anger? point. That's Where's a great point. Where's the anger at them? It doesn't exist because I don't think the story is real. I think real. only That's Brett, Barnes, no Brett Barnes was angry because he was put into the story and he came out and he said, none, none, of, the, none of this happened. Um, I don't want to be, I don't want to be mentioned in the movie. Nobody even apologized for that. You know, uh, Brett Barnes has been very consistent. I've even had some communication with Brett Barnes. Uh, I mean, he is 100 percent supportive of Michael Jackson. Uh, the film absolutely implies strongly that Brett Barnes was abused and that this was all part of Michael Jackson's M.O., that he would leave one particular uh, abuse victim when they hit puberty and move on to another. Well, yet there are other elements of the film that completely contradict that, including Brett Barnes and Macaulay Culkin. Uh, both Macaulay, of them would yeah. have to be abused if this MO was true, but both of which have said that never happened. All right, let's uh, let's see another tweet. Um, Rick tweeted us. He said, "Pardon my poor English. Is it normal among the U.S. media journalists to do uh, not to do any research before selling their news or articles?" I'm not from the U.S., but live in Neverland shows me how poor journalism standard is in the United States. Why is it so clear that their agenda is attack Michael? Jackson only. Well, uh, that person's English might not be very it's good, great. but their, but their <laughs> understanding perfect, of, of the American media is outstanding. <laughs> because I can tell you, having, again, lived this story and others like it, uh, that that is 100% sadly true. The news media does no research of their own. If they like a story, if they like a narrative, and it fits their agenda, whether it's political or ratings-wise, whatever it is. That all that all that gets done is that that story gets copy and pasted, and maybe doesn't even get a new headline. That, that's all it is, because we live in a world where, first of all, safety is everything. No one wants to lose their job, and number two. No one has time to do any kind of research. No one has the resources to do any research, or, or, sort of research. There's no need when you've already got the narrative that you want. And it when sells. Michael Jackson- And it sells. So it's, well, exactly. it's good that's enough, right? There's, there's, that's, that is a huge part of what 
the news media's agenda is. There's there's different agendas. One of them is the financial agenda. And when it's about Michael Jackson and he's dead and he can't fight back, uh, and it already fits what a lot of people have already suspected, this is as easy as it comes. People, I mean, that's a headline people will be interested in and have no problem believing. Michael Jackson accused of being a sex abuser. Uh, the fact that the truth is different uh, and that, the, that there's nuance and that there's facts that contradict that, that's, first of all, that's work. The news media doesn't want to do work. And second of all, that's dangerous because it is dangerous, again, especially in the post-Me Too era, to even remotely question an alleged mm -hmm. victim of sexual abuse. And what's really strange to me, and maybe the most dangerous element of Me Too, we're now living in a world where you get less scrutiny if your allegation is 20, 25, or 30 years old than if you make it contemporaneously. <laughs> That's what's really strange about all this. In, 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 I mean, frankly, a contemporaneous allegation could be theoretically disproven because you have a date and you know whether or not mm -hmm. someone was in mm -hmm. town, what they were doing that day. 20, 30 years ago, it's basically impossible to disprove a negative. And that's what, especially when you're dead, and that's what the uh, those who are being accused are being forced to do in a situation where the media is completely on the other side. And when they are proven to be wrong, they have no interest in admitting that. And they will rationalize everything they possibly can to make sure that, the, that they're never proven wrong, no matter how overwhelming the evidence is. All right. I have one more question for you, John. Uh, but before that, I would like to th thank uh, Michael Jackson's fans all around the world for their questions, for their comments that they left on uh, the very introduction of this interview. Um, so one last question, John. Do you think that Michael Jackson's legacy will live on from this generation, past generation, this generation, to the next, no matter what? Well, it will do at least some degree. I, to what degree, I think, is still an open question. I, I, I think that there's a little bit of overconfidence on the part of some within the Jackson um, estate and uh, his, his uh, legal team and his fan base because it hasn't been devastating. But what, what happens when someone has been dead for a long time, it's very difficult to regenerate interest uh, and, and that legacy. And when it uh, kind of gets its legs, maybe if not cut off, at, at least, uh, you know, maybe pulled a hamstring or, or uh, mm -hmm. got an Achilles uh, tendon tear or something like that, whatever analogy you want to use, uh, unless that gets fully repaired quickly, I think over time there is attrition. And so I think this is still a critical time in determining what that ultimate legacy 10, 20, 30 years from now will be. Now, on the other hand, uh, eventually these allegations will fade away in, into memory as well. Uh, so there's, there's positive and negatives to this phenomenon. But the short answer is I, I am... I am optimistic that uh, this will not destroy his legacy, but I still think that this is a battle that needs to be completely won now, especially when the truth is clearly on his side. On his side. John, you've done great. Thank you so much for taking time to speak with me. Thank you. Thanks for caring about the truth. Thank you. John Ziegler was my guest. We discussed Leaving Neverland and Michael Jackson's legacy. I'm Ika Federer-Gotic. Goodbye.